egg. AMC, MC, MC. The Bohemian Rhapsody scene in Wayne's World is as good as the opening scene in A New Hope because it shows you everything you need to know about the characters. Wayne Campbell is a loser. His shirt is generic. His jeans are old and ripped. He explains that he works minimum wage jobs, primarily food service because he has a collection of name tags and hairnets. The movie never says how old Wayne Campbell is, but Mike Myers was 28 or 29 during filming, so Wayne would be the same age, still living at his parents' house, which is both bogus and sad. He doesn't even own a car. Wayne relies on Garth Algar's 1976 AMC Pacer to get around. Now, the movie takes place in present-day 1992, which made Garth's 76 Pacer a 16-year-old economy car at the time. 15 to 20 years old is the perfect age for a cheap car, a loser's car. By 1992, the Pacer was a joke, a slow, carbureted car. <laughs> what are flames doing on it? Wh what are you trying to tell me? This is a fast car? What a loser. If Wayne's World were shot in the year 2020, Garth would, have, Garth would be driving a 2004 Dodge Neon. Not an SRT4, a base neon. With, with, with no, no fog lamps either. But it would have a fake hood scoop and a spoiler pop riveted to the trunk lid. What a loser. That is how low the Pacer sunk in the 1990s. Its mere presence was comical. But in the movie, what do our protagonists do when they pile into their old car? They sing. They help a hungover friend. Wayne sets a goal of owning a classic guitar. The city of Chicago passes by in lights as Bohemian Rhapsody ebbs. Their favorite donut shop draws closer. Our protagonists, in that moment, are happy. They have each other, thanks to their car, the Mirthmobile. Oh, and another thing. Penelope Spheris shows the tape cassette going into the head unit. By 1992, CDs were the new thing. But pointing out that they're listening to it on a cassette further shows how out of touch the pacer was with the current age, 1992. I mean, later in the movie, you know, after the protagonists get their, their buyout or whatever, uh, a portable, they get a portable CD player and it, it, it's uh, with a cape, tape cassette adapter and it's attached to the dash. And that's like, it's like supposed to be a big deal. Now, Jake's pacer here has a further adoption with a retro sound Bluetooth unit, but it doesn't fit because the pacer, like, like it was just style over like 60s tech back then. It's not the old 60s style. I don't know the term for it. The, the tiny head unit, my Falcon has the same one. And it's not a single din or double din. It's like this odd size and it's not a square. It's this rounded edge. It's not even a parallelogram. <laughs> It's just like this shape and it's asymmetrical. So what he had to do to make the uh, head unit work so he could have Bluetooth was to cut his own backing to that and then put the retro sound in there. Now, if you wanted to keep the old head unit and still have Bluetooth, you could give credence to the only company who wants to deal with regular car reviews. I could just talk about pralines and dick and Cove doesn't care. So you have a Bluetooth speaker, you pull it apart and... You know, honestly, this is kind of cool. This is like you could take both ends of this Bluetooth speaker and shove it in the headrest like this. I mean, it was like it was made for it. And JDM Miatas think they're all that. Just press the button and listen to this thing play generic rock because I can't play Bohemian Rhapsody because of copyright. CoveAudio.com slash RTC64. Code RCT64 gets you 65% off of the Cove Audio split. A pacer drives oddly. Like, it's so wide that the width of the wheelbase gets a little bit too close to its length. It has sloppy 70s steering, but it has a rack and pinion. 
So you get tons of on center slop, but then once the steering kicks in, the car wants to go and Jake has wider wheels on this. So it is planted, but the body doesn't want to do what the wheels and suspension are asking of it. So you get turns that go like this. People in the comments are going to be like, why aren't you driving it with both hands? I'm like, oh, this is the correct way. Oh, there's a sharp turn. Watch it, watch it. Sorry. Yep. Oh, whoa. Yeah, that's why I'm, I, I mean that. Like, that's why with the brakes, I just give, your, give yourself enough time because this thing, yeah. between that body roll and, the, and uh, being a little trickier to slow down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No overdrive, huh? That's a shame. I mean, using the 232 cubic inch Jeep engine in this, it, it's, 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 not, it's the wrong engine for an economy car. The AMC Straight 6 isn't a bad engine. It's a light truck engine, which is what a Jeep it really is at its base. But that engine is made to be long lasting and give a lot of torque, not be fuel efficient. And the Pacer was made to be a commuter car where fuel efficiency is a thing. The 232 straight six gives enough torque for you to have overdrive, but AMC didn't give it overdrive. So you got this poor straight six kind of screaming away at 65 miles an hour and just gulping up gas. But I want one. Yes, because of the movie. Look, the pacer was ahead of its time. If we're being dead honest and not being swallowed up to our balls in rewritten history, because people want to claim they saw the Arab oil crisis coming, but only my man Dick Teague was out here in these mean streets preparing for it. But then the big three came along and wanted to get in on the action like they knew the demand for small cars was around the corner all along. It's like the story of the hen who baked the bread and nobody wanted to help bake it, but everybody wanted a piece. Sure, hot bread is on the menu, but who actually baked that shit? You see, uh, let me back this up. Head stylist Dick Teague decided to start working on the Pacer in 1971 because he anticipated the rising tide against land yachts, with Americans desiring smaller cars with better fuel economy. The future was gaining on them in the miserable decathlon of the tumultuous late 60s that bled like a burst hemorrhoid into the early 1970s. And just like shotgun in a cramped sports car, Dick called it. The fuel crisis that led to small imports becoming all the rage, the desire for more fuel-efficient, aerodynamic cars, and styling cues as stultifying in their appeal as the desperate pickup lines of a divorced father of four. Hey baby, can I clip your toenails this weekend? And keep all the clippings? Of course, the problem Teague ran into was twofold. For one, AMC wanted this to have a wankle engine and even signed a deal with manufacturing company Curtis Wright to produce them. But then AMC decided it'd make more sense to work with GM, who was already developing their own rotary engines, or trying to anyway, until that project was scrapped due to mechanical and financial concerns, which left AMC without an engine for the pacer. So they had to redesign the car to accept their bog standard in line six. You know, just get this weird, immature-looking car done already. AMC Pacer, the official car of walking a swear word into freshly fallen snow. By the time the Pacer debuted for 1975, it was a marvel of cultish proportions that AMC promoted as the first wide small car due to its similar width to the full-size domestics of the era, while car and driver called it the Flying Fishbowl, which incidentally used to be my superhero name when I patrolled the mean, unforgiving, detritus-riddled streets of Reading, Pennsylvania, where smoke billows like chimney stacks and society lives at the edge of an Indiana Jones quote. You lost today, kid. But that doesn't mean you have to like it. The flying fishbowl strikes again. I, I, I came up with a theme song for myself, but it didn't really get over. Oh yeah, the pacer. Uh, so people couldn't really make heads or tails of this car in its own time. And I think that's mostly because people didn't really think of round cars as anything other than something that got Volkswagen stiff in the jeans. But the whole point was to distinguish the Pacer from whatever AMC's competitors were making, even if the general sense within the company was that the public wasn't ready for it. There's typically a quote misattributed to Henry Ford about how if he'd asked what the public wanted before he started making cars, most of them would have said, a faster horse. And so it is that, more than in most sectors, the automotive industry relies on the presumption of knowing what the consumer wants before they want it. 
This was the mentality at work here, with AMC's chairman even going as far as to warn the public that this would be controversial, ooh, that some people might not like it, which seems like a dumb marketing strategy, although no dumber than perpetuating the lie that a niche product will satisfy everyone. And I'll tell you right now, the biggest red flag in media today is when someone says, we made this for the fans. You know, you know, it's for old fans and new fans, so basically you're telling me it's for no one. Cool. It's, it's almost as big of a red flag as, you know, that old chestnut of, we're returning to our roots. We, we feel like we're really getting back to basics with this one. It's like they're preempting the awful critical reviews they know they're going to get by appealing to people to defend them online when it hits the fan like a foul ball. But controversy can be a good thing if it grabs headlines. And automotive journalists were lining up like lemmings to get a look at this rolling jelly bean, with at least some of them concluding that it was a fairly pragmatic car for the time, more nimble in city driving than the long boys. But for every popular mechanics review praising the rack and pinion steering, you had your road and track review calling the engineering old-fashioned and unimaginative in comparison to its styling. And yeah, I, I can kind of see that, even though they've gone on to become cult icons today and immensely collectible. They still have that sort of hometown soda pop aesthetic. AMC Pacer, the official car of late night bowling and microwave chicken tenders from the snack bar. Okay, so here, here's the deal. While the Pacer sold some 145,528 units in its first year, generally thanks to how ill-prepared other domestic automakers were when it came to the fuel crisis, the explosion in popularity for imports made the Pacer kind of redundant. By the 1980s, it was practically a novelty, falling off by the wayside into a very niche segment, like boys who drink nothing but apple juice growing up to become men who put ketchup on everything, chasing that constant corn syrup high and calling it novel. The problem with the Pacer is that it chased a segment of the consumers who wanted something smaller and more fuel efficient, but only did half measures. On the one hand, the Pacer aimed for fuel efficiency, but with a curb weight of around 3,000 pounds, you need a really low drag and some big aerodynamics to offset the difference, which this pacer had, but everything came back to the dimensions. It wasn't a sexy car. It's like all the early American cars to use rack and pinion steering ended up with a bad rap. Case in point, this was only the second U.S. production car with that steering configuration. After the Pinto. So yeah rare company there. In essence, the Pacer is the disposable camera of cars. It's fine for a commuter, but like a disposable camera, once the roll is finished and you've captured all the memories you're gonna get, you might as well toss it and get something more effective and fashionable. Of course, I'm looking at it through the eyes of a contemporary from that era. Looking at it today, I mean, why would you ever get rid of this thing? I mean, odds are it could, it, who knows how much these would appreciate in value over time, how immensely collectible they would become. And in a lot of ways, Dick Teague was a visionary. But even then, it doesn't really explain or excuse AMC's overconfidence in the public's willingness to accept a third-gen Taurus 20 years before its time. AMC was choking on its own load here. So quick they were to anoint a car they loved, AMC had to allow for the likelihood that the general public wouldn't feel the same way. Yet they had to take that calculated risk because they weren't in the same position of money-burning privilege as the big three. Again, the auto industry is predicated on knowing what consumers want before they do. And this was a miscalculation. Maybe if the men in charge knew then what they would know in just a few years' time, but I've never understood that line of thinking. I don't wish I knew then what I know now, because knowing things is pointless without the experience that led you to knowing them in the first place. As time passed, the Pacer became the de facto cheap commuter car, the hand-me-down to student drivers, retirees, and grad students on their fifth course with gravity's rainbow in the syllabus. Yet its identity changed over time, sliding down the rock face of the late 80s auto industry and import automakers starting luxury brands with big dick money clip energy. Yet the AMC Pacer found purchase, 
among the degenerates of Generation X, a group whose future only extended as far as the smoke from the last bong rip. AMC was dead by now, which made it that much cooler. Dude, they don't even make this car anymore. Now, it was small, but you could comfortably fit your entire entourage into this like you're on your way to the circus, and then park it at the summit of Handjob Head and talk about how this was the first U.S. small car to isolate the passenger compartment from the noise of the engine and suspension systems in between thirsty kisses and clumsy hand strokes. Then you drive your AMC Pacer back to Liam's mom's house to talk about how hands were on your balls that were not your own. The best night of your life, a wash in the salt-logged sea of perspiration and expired curfews. Memories as vivid and enduring as the invention of friendship itself. And don't you forget about it! God, I'm sick of being so horny! I see Cody Four and Angela White more than my own friends and family. AMC Pacer, the official car of self-actualization. Because not everyone reaches his or her full potential, but you don't have to be the absolute best version of yourself to be happy. Hell, maybe the happiest version is the best one. Now, I wasn't allowed to see Wayne's World when it came out because my parents thought it was a bad movie because there's sex in it. I don't, I don't even know. They probably didn't, they didn't even see the movie, but they probably heard from someone else at church that, oh, you can't go see Wayne's World. There's sex in it. And later when I watched the movie, I was like, okay, there's the Dana Carvey scene where he's dancing to, to Foxy Lady going, uh, 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 with his shirt tied around his waist. Okay. So later I saw the movie in middle school and thought, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Ribbed for her pleasure. Ew. <laughs> that scene still gets me. But I started asking people after the shoot, like I, I sent pictures of us dressed up and like 20% of my friends who are younger didn't know what we were, didn't know who we were dressed up as. I mean, some people said, is that that old Mike Myers movie? And I'm like, yeah. I was like, you, you never saw Wayne's World? No. What the hell? I mean, when I was in marching band, I started driving in 1998. And my friends and I, we would drive to Dunkin' Donuts and the bowling alley. And everybody had a Queen CD and everybody had a tape cassette. And you would just play Bohemian Rhapsody and act out. I, I must have done it at least 12 times where you just play Bohemian Rhapsody and everybody headbangs. That movie came out in 92 and we were still doing it in 98. Maybe I guess trends moved slower in the 90s. But you gotta give credit to Wayne's World. It revitalized the band Queen when no one cared about it. Wayne's World did more for that band than the biopic did. And the car, the Mirthmobile, was a celebration of friendship. It was a space in which to find camaraderie. And driving a car as airy and big and as this on the inside, you feel a connection to everybody else inside the car. You are warmed by all of the light and the, the sun's energy coming through this. I mean, I, it's better than a convertible. And furthermore, it was a nugget of happiness in the middle of the selfish 1970s. And driving a pace around brings joy to everybody who sees it. So maybe the movie gave it the correct name after all. Nothing like a pacer, stylish jelly bean. Rack and pinion steering. Rack and pinion steering. And cheese.